Well, today I'd just like to try and touch on three things the Holy Spirit does. And the first is from the gospel that we've just heard. Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Those whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Those whose sins you retain, they are retained. So there's this link between the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of sins. Now the Holy Spirit and sin are enemies. Uh, sin is something hard and stony or knotted and lumpish. Uh, it's heavy. But the Holy Spirit is like flowing water or wind or fire or green things growing. He's compared with things that live and move and breathe. So even in imagery, we see that the Holy Spirit and sin are incompatible. And when the Holy Spirit comes, when his influence starts to shape our lives, he disengages us from sin. Uh, he shows it up to us. He enlightens our conscience. Our excuses begin to seem less convincing. And he moves our hearts. Maybe we even start to cry. We are being converted. And we seek out the sources of forgiveness that Christ has lodged in the church. Baptism, if we've not been baptized, and the sacrament of reconciliation for sins after baptism. And we realize that we have some forgiving to do ourselves and some forgiveness to ask of others. And all of this is the secret, silent work of the Holy Spirit. It may happen suddenly. It may be a long process with backward steps as well as forward ones. We may go round in circles for years. But this link, Holy Spirit and forgiveness, is always there. It has been there since the first Easter and the first Pentecost, and it's here now, waiting to embrace us. The Holy Spirit moves us from the state of sin, of enmity with God, into the state of grace, the state of friendship with him. And the things St. Paul mentions in that second reading, fornication, gross indecency, sexual irresponsibility, idolatry and sorcery, feuds and wrangling, jealousy, bad temper, quarrels, disagreements, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and similar things, the whole soap opera of fallen human life. These things can now belong to the past. And his other litany, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, these things can start to sing within us. It's not just that the guilt of original sin or actual sin is taken away. The Holy Spirit gets to grips with that deeper thing, our whole, you might say, out of kilterness, our off tuneness, our sinfulness that lies behind any specific misdeeds. It's the whole work of cleansing and purifying our heart that gets underway. It's our recreation in the image and likeness of God that is being hammered out on the anvil of life. And it will go on our whole life, this purification of our heart and after death, if need be. And its upshot, please God, will be a final absolution that will shine on us from the eyes of Christ when we see him face to face. Your sins are forgiven, my child. Pentecost releases 
all this into our lives, this grace of forgiveness of sin, this path of purification, this path to purity of heart. Well, now here's a second thing the Holy Spirit does. Uh, it's the same, really, but more from the outside. Uh, it was in today's first reading. Now, there were devout men living in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the sound of the apostles, praising and proclaiming God, they all assembled. And then there's this list of places with challenging names, uh, Mesopotamia and Cappadocia and Phrygia and Pamphylia uh, and all the rest, a kind of tour of the world as it was known in the first century Mediterranean. Uh, yesterday uh, we had the same reading here and a 12-year-old boy uh, read it flawlessly. I mean, I need hardly say it was read flawlessly this morning, um, but <laughs> it can be quite a challenge. But the point is, they all assembled, they gathered, they came together. That's what the word means. And after Peter has spoken, after that, Peter goes on and gives a homily, and 3,000 of them were baptized. This is the beginning of the church, the birthday of the church, as we often say. And here uh, we can begin to glimpse the, the, the beauty of what it is that God does in the world for our poor humanity. He, 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 the Father, he sends his Son into our fallen world to lift him up. And he lifts up his Son on the cross and in the resurrection. He concentrates salvation and our, our recreation in the person of Jesus. But the person of Jesus lived and died and taught and rose in one small area of the world at one brief time. So the question is, how can we, people from other places, other times, how can we access, how can we connect to this salvation? Well, if you'll pardon the image, it's as if the Holy Spirit is a great uh, benign uh, lasso, uh, as it were, that's twirling through the world, uh, twirling through history, and catches us and draws us uh, into to Christ and to the cross, to the Savior. Or to be more biblical, he's the net thrown into the sea, and we are the fish that are caught. He gathers believers from every nation under heaven, generation after generation. And this is the church, the universal church, one and Catholic. This is what the word church means, gathering or assembly. The church is truly the original world wide web. And all this is the doing of the Holy Spirit. We are the doing of the Holy Spirit. And we have to look beyond personalities and squabbles and scandals and all of that and all the criticisms that are thrown at us and recognize the wonder. I mean, uh, the creation, the universe, the world, the planet is actually a wonder. It is a standing miracle. It is our sad, downcast, averted eyes that miss the many splendid thing. And the church, too, is a standing wonder. It is astonishing that it is, that it has been for 2,000 years, that it is now, and that it will continue to live and to grow, because here we are in a fragmented world with so many attachments fracturing and so many mutual animosity. And here in the midst is the wonder of the church, holding together 
despite everything, pulling us apart. St. Augustine has a beautiful phrase for the church. It is the world reconciled. It is humanity reconciled and being reconciled and being gathered together. Here are we gathered Sunday after Sunday in the Eucharist. The Holy Spirit is like a great conductor who keeps this wild orchestra together. He's the great connector. So he's always creating the mystery of communion between a parish and its priest, between the priests and the parishes and the bishop and the diocese, between brothers in a monastery, between the pope and the faithful, between the new and the old. Here he is in, in Ab <coughs> Aberdeen even, gathering people from every nation under heaven to come to our various churches, gathering Scots and Brits and Africans and Indians and Poles and Latin Americans and all the people I'm leaving out. It, it, it's, it's happening somehow, despite everything, it hangs together. Uh, he's f for individuals. The Holy Spirit is forging bonds of Christian friendships in families. He's bringing husbands and wives back together when they start to drift apart, or parents and children gathering the domestic church. There's this wonderful work of God going on before our eyes. May our eyes open to see it. It's a divine gift to share in the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's released at Pentecost. It's a movement, uh, a process. It's a flowing stream. And may we enter into it. And then there's one last thing. The Holy Spirit, it says, first reading again, gave them the gift of speech. That is to say, the first disciples, the apostles especially. The apostles found their voice. They began to proclaim the marvels of God. They had been disciples. They had been listeners. And now they became speakers. And this, I think, is another thing the Holy Spirit does. I think for Christianity in the world, for the church as a whole, he enables the Christianity to find its voice, to speak of the marvels of God in different cultures, different times, different generations, and so forth, to do that. Now, it's a voice, as we know, that won't always win a referendum, no. Uh, it's a voice that will often be countercultural or overcome by other voices. It is a voice that will need to find better ways of saying what it want, has to say, what the Lord has given it to say. That's why, in a way, the Holy Father is called a synod on marriage and the family, so that the church can, can find her voice in these matters of, of man and woman and marriage and family and sexuality and so forth. But we can take this for ourselves as well. I remember a monk who was, he was confirmed, I don't know when he was about 20 or something, and he said, well, I've never stopped talking since. I uh, received the gift of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gave him the gift of speech. Uh, <laughs> well, there we are. Um, but yesterday in, in the little country of El Salvador, in, in, in the city of San Salvador, there was beatified uh, Oscar Romero, who was the Archbishop of San Salvador in the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, well, up to 1980. And it was a very fraught time in that country where uh, those in power were committing very grave injustices. There was a great deal of assassination and torture and uh, unlawful arrests and so forth and murders and everything going on. And Romero found his voice slowly, gradually, and he spoke out against this and condemned these injustices on the basis of the gospel, on the basis of the Ten Commandments indeed. He spoke out and therefore he was assassinated. He was shot 
killed during Mass. He died at the altar. There was a sniper who shot into the church and killed him. So, but even then, he, be, he continued to speak. I mean, his death, he found his voice, most of all, you might say, in death, and so has become a great figure and inspiration for the people of Latin America. There are many ways of finding our voice. It's not necessarily by speaking. It, it, it can be by life. It can be even be by silence sometimes. Uh, but this is a gift that the Holy Spirit brings, that we can speak God's words. We can tell of the marvels of God in our life. So we're praying today, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. May he fill all our hearts today.